Hi, I'm Melanie Haynes, and this is Dark Magazine. Today I'm talking to Ben Aronovich. Ben was born and raised a Londoner. His father, Sam, was, a, was an economist and a senior member of the Communist Party of Britain. Yep. His brother, Owen, is a soapy star, and his other brother, David, is an award-winning journalist. So, quite a family. Ben, uh, Ben's family, pardon? The swine, he's the successful one. So we... <laughs> Ben's career took off when he wrote the classic Doctor Who story, Remembrance of the Daleks, where Ace famously attacks a Dalek with a baseball bat. He wrote another Doctor Who episode called Battlefield before expanding his horizons by working for Casualty, a B-grade SF soap, Junior, uh, Jupiter Moon. Yes, lovely. Then he expanded into novels, short stories, comics, and audio dramas, including Black Seven, More Doctor Who, and lately his Rivers of London series about Peter Grant, an inept policeman who accidentally discovers the supernatural world that coexists with our own, and then he becomes a wizard or a yeah, spelling. I, I reject the word inept. <laughs> oh, okay, fair enough. Oh, he, he just seemed um, a bit... Uh, challenged in the first book particularly <laughs> Play for laughs. excitable it's excitable oh yeah yeah definitely excitable so anyway well welcome ben um your, your career really took off after writing remembrance for daleks uh well it went it took off and then it and then it went into a kind of terminal tailspin for quite a long time uh, and then it's taken off again I, i've been very lucky i've managed to have two careers so I, I'm quite grateful for that. So do you think that had anything to do with the BBC like becoming so well known for that Doctor Who episode in particular? And the no, BBC... You have to understand that in, 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 in television world, uh, before Doctor Who came back, uh, having a Doctor Who credit was sort of an anti-credit. It was actually worse than not having any credits at all. Uh, it meant that you were associated with Doctor Who, which was very, very, very badly looked down on. And so, therefore, it was probably a drag on my career. Um, I, I wouldn't say it was the reason my career went away, but it's, it, you know, I don't think it ever helped me in any way, particularly. I mean, except to get to conventions and meet nice people and, and that kind of stuff. But, it, you know, in, in the career, right, in the world of the given, it didn't really help very much. Do you think that's changed a bit these days? Oh, yeah. Well, nothing succeeds like success. So Doctor Who is now so hugely successful that even though most of them secretly hate it, television executives have to at least admit that it might be quite good. <laughs> yes, well, it makes the money, doesn't it? Yes, and that's the bottom line. Yeah. You wrote in the new adventure series of novels before it diverged from Doctor Who when it followed Bernice Sun uh, when it diverged, it followed Bernice Summerfield while the BBC didn't hold the rights to the series. Um, what was it like working on Doctor Who stories while the TV series wasn't running and while they were in the process of selling the rights? Well, it, it was rather brilliant because um, the BBC didn't care. So usually when you write a tie-in series, like you, you usually have layers and layers and layers of interference right the way up the ladder. You know, starting with your, the publisher and then working your way up to whoever's running the TV show and a bunch of suits. You know, you know, I know people who are writing Star Trek and they're writing Star Wars tie-ins. And, you know, the nightmare, the nightmare they tell you, is that, oh, you can't do this, you can't do that. If you talk to Doctor Who writers now, they're always talking about Cardiff. That's the way they go. It has to be approved by Cardiff. It's like the... It's like the it's like Rome, you know, these, the, these information has to be handed yes. down by Cardiff. Yes. But when we were writing the new adventures, there were, there were no rules. So we could just do what we liked. And we did. That's why they're so varied. If you look at the new adventures, they're an incredibly varied bunch of books with an incredibly wide range of approaches to, to Doctor Who. And I'm, I'm very, very interested. I think they're going to be a very interesting cultural artifact if they don't all get pumped and disappear into history. Well, I think the, uh, the original like paperbacks are, um, are now collector's items. And don't, don't you think they're, they, have they come back as e-books? Are they going to come back as e-books? Oh, uh, no, because Virgin lost the rights. Oh, okay. As far as I know, Virgin lost the rights to BBC. So Virgin still have the rights, as far as I know, to the actual stories. The individual authors still have the rights to the stories, the, I think their own stories, but um, I don't know. It's very complicated. I, 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 it's not something I really worry about. It's like I, I'm happy to have done it, and if they want to republish them, that's fine. But um, mm. 
I, I don't, it's, you know, I, they, they were what they were of their time and they're interesting and I think they're fun and I'm happy to sign them when they get passed in front of me at conventions and stuff. But uh, I think, I, I don't worry about it. It's not sort of thing I think about. I, I have people who think about that sort of thing. I don't have to think about these things anymore. Which is excellent. You have people. I think well, I have an agent. People. He worries about this sort of stuff. You know, if, if it ever comes up, it, it will be my agent's worry, not mine. Yes. I'll just serenely go on like a swan. <laughs> um, I haven't found any mention of you working on the new adventures after Doctor Who left the ser the series and the books diverged. And no, I, I, I didn't. Mm. But you wrote a prequel. I, I wrote a prequel to Bernie Summerfield well, uh, for Big Finish, yes. And that was a lot of fun. And I, I think 157 people have read that. And so I'm, I'm quite proud of that. <laughs> I think that's got to be my least read thing I've ever written. And that includes Jupiter Moon. So that's quite impressive. <laughs> um, since then, you've written six Rivers of London novels. I'm counting the one that's been published in June because I'm assuming you've finished writing it. Absolutely. Mm. Um, and that's set in a world that you've built yourself. What's the difference between writing in someone else's sandbox and writing your own unique stories? Uh, oh, God. Uh, absence of... Um, I have a friend, actually, who's a Thai writer, and he's just been commissioned... He, he just sold a book, uh, an original non thai book, and he was did a two-book contract, and he handed in the first book, and... <laughs> He says, Ben, uh, you know, uh, I went in and I asked them, I said, uh, we're, we're doing the the second book, doing the second book. And I said, do you want a, a, an outline? And they said, no, we just want you to write the book. And that's the difference. If, you, if you're doing a tie-in, people want, people want control over the material. But if you're writing a book, your publisher just wants you to write the book. You know, they, they may edit it at, after you've done it, but they're not interested in looking at outlines and stuff at that point. Not if you have a two book contract. They, you know, it's not the, it's a completely different level of control. And it's wonderful, it's very liberating. And at the same time, it's kind of terrifying. It's like operating without a safety net, without a supervisor. You know, sometimes it's nice to have someone say, go left, go right, go left, go right. But at the same time, sometimes it's nice to just do what you want. So I like to do what I want, personally. I, I don't think I can go back to tie-ins again because it's too restrictive. But I mean, I like tie-ins and I liked writing tie-ins and I, I'm not one of these people that thinks that tie-ins is an inferior form of um, uh, writing. It's just that you are under more control. People want control of, because it's their IP. They're in control of the IP and they want control of that IP. I understand that you mess with, you want to use Rivers of London, I, I want total control of my IP. So, but it, uh, it's, it's restrictive and it can be, it can be chafing. And so it's more, sometimes it can be more fun to use your own stuff. Mm. Yeah, and speaking of your intellectual property, um, what can you tell us about Rivers of London without spoiling the entire series for us? And the, so an overall um, description of the series, but also of Fox God Summer, the your latest book that has, was published late last year. Um, well, uh, Rivers of London. It's about Peter Grant, who is a not inept um, police officer working for the Metro Police, but young, young and somewhat inexperienced, let's say. And enthusiastic. <laughs> and enthusiastic, who is probably, who is in some ways a very good copper, in some ways not a very good copper. And the reason why he's sometimes not a very good copper is he tends to get a little bit distracted by the esoteric things of aspects of London, so, so the history and the you know, where the lions come from on Trafalgar Square and things like that, where maybe he should be spending a little bit more time concentrating on, on you know, breaking up dangerous crowds of drinkers and stuff. But, you know, he probably would be quite good in a specialist role, you know, as long as he didn't have to fight anyone. And um, he's guarding a crime scene. He's guarding a crime scene with his friend Leslie May when uh, when a man comes forward and says, I saw the whole thing, he saw the whole murder of the, of the crime scene he's guarding, and Peter sees his chance to kind of shine in the eyes of his superiors, there's just one little problem, and that is uh, the, the witness is a ghost. So he then, uh, but because Peter is like enough of a policeman, he then tries to take a witness statement from a ghost, and because he's persistently trying to take, get information from this ghost, he comes to the attention of of the tiny little bra, bra, uh, division that deals with magic in 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 London in Met, for, Met, for the Metropolitan Police, and because he discovers magic is real, because he's discovered ghosts are real, he's discovered magic is real. He then he then pretty much uh, makes sure that he then becomes part of that 
division. He campaigns to become a, an apprentice, despite the fact that everyone says, no, no, don't do it. And then he, he becomes an apprentice. And the rest of the books are about his adventures. So basically, they are they're police procedurals with magic, basically. And so each story is a case. So the second case deals with jazz in Soho. And the third case is about um, a murder on the under, London Underground. The fourth case is a, a mysterious um, council estate in South London. Strange things are going on. And uh, the fifth one, um, he finds himself out of his comfort zone, which is London, and thrust into a missing persons case in Herefordshire. So, yeah, which uh, for those of you who don't know the geography of England is quite a long way from London and very rural. He makes so, a comment that if he went any further off his manor, they'd be speaking Welsh. Yes. Well, because literally they would be. They would be speaking Welsh <laughs> because it's on the borders. It's the borders of between England and Wales. And and the sixth one is going to be about Peter's going to face his ter most, the most terrible foe yet, which is rich people. Oh, dear. So, <laughs> The 1%. Yes, the 1%. He's taking on the 1%. <laughs> oh, that'll be entertaining. Now, Peter's the quintessential geek. He references everything from Lord of the Rings to various games, much to others' dismay, and, you know, the wind whistling over their heads. Um, are you consciously targeting a particular audience with the various elements you're including in your story? No, no, he, he just, <laughs> he's just like that. I mean, Peter's just like that character. He, you know, he, he, yeah, he's a, he's a, he's a bit of a geek, you know, you know, as some people are. It's not a crime yet, and um, and it's I not, and it's not, you know, and you know, you can be a geek and a policeman. There's no, there's no actual kind of got, you know, on the form. You don't have to put, you know, are you a geek? Yes, and then they won't let you in. It's, um, and he likes it. Like most people, he like most people drop references. You know, like most geeks, most people though drop references all the time into their conversation, and that's just what Peter is doing. I have to admit, some of them are amazingly obscure, and I do like putting very, very obscure references in. But it's not just kind of geek references. He drops references to West African cooking, to to cars, to you know. I, I like to put jokes for lots of different groups. He puts some very specific sign of police jokes in there that are only really funny if you're a police officer. In fact, they're probably only really funny if you're a specific type of police officer from London. And and I like to put lo lots of jokes. The thing is, most the geek ones are the most accessible. There are some very obscure architect jokes in there as well. It's just something he I like to do. It's just a laugh. I like to I like every group reading the book to feel that they've got at least one joke for just just for them. So the books are more a reflection of, of you and your catering to everybody. Well, I, I, you can't really think about that. You can't write to a market. Mm. It's almost impossible to write to a market. My books don't sell to the market I thought they were going to sell to at all. So, I mean, I, but I didn't aim at that market. It's just like that, that was the market. As a bookseller, I was a bookseller at the time. I thought those were the people who were going to buy uh, the books and it, it turned out not to be those people well they, they did as well but lots of other people and now my publisher hails me as some kind of cross genre genius but basically I wrote the books I wanted to write and I was incredibly lucky and other people liked them and that's really the only thing you can do you can only write the books that you really want to write and then just hope that it's of interest to other people you can't if you try and hit the zeitgeist you nearly always miss because by the time you've written the book the zeitgeist is something else and people when people hit the zeitgeist they usually hit it entirely fortuitously and and um that you know that's the way it is there's, there's nothing you can do about it yeah well i was going to comment on the fact that you've incorporated architecture gas patrick o'brien novels and lord of the rings and much more into your novels but you've already covered all of that Yep. <laughs> one of the things that I would still like to say is that I know one person, Kathleen Jennings, who went and read all of Patrick O'Brien's novels because he referenced them. <laughs> I, thought, I mean, I can't even remember what the reference to Patrick O'Brien novels was. The Yellow Spines. Oh, the yes, show. yes, yes. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, yes. Well, there are a lot of them. They're very good. I think I, I, I regard that as a public service because <laughs> they're very good novels. I, I like them a lot. Well, that's, that's great. I have heard of Master and Commander, but I must confess I haven't read any myself. So what, what do you think is so intriguing about the Lost Rivers? Well, they're lost. <laughs> 
I mean, no, they're interesting because a lot of people walk, go to work and people mostly, when they think of the rivers of London, they think of the Thames. Uh, and occasionally they think of the Lee and maybe even the Fleet. But there are there are actually dozens of rivers and some of them are not lost. Some of them are lost, like Ephra, Tyburn, Cantus Creek. Some of them, like Beverly Brook, uh, are out on the open. You can walk along Beverly Brook. She has nature parks and everything. It's a nice walk. And some of them... Um, well, one of the things I find interesting is in recent years there's been a, a move to sort of improve a lot of the above surface rivers and so make them more prettify them and uh, return them. They, a lot of them were culverted, which, as you probably know, is very bad for flooding. And so, therefore, uh, there's a move to make them meander more, to put them in, uh, reopen the water meadows. So there's more resilience in the flood, flood, flooding resilience and stuff like that. And as we have very wet, we're having much more wet. Um, days in, in London, as the weather becomes wetter because of global warming, uh, the, I, people are finding it, you know, these rivers are more and more interesting and they start rising more. Now, I went up on the Heath the other day and because it was so very, very wet, I could actually see where the fleet was rising on Hampstead Heath. And it's quite rare that you actually, actually see where it's actually rising on the hillside. You can sort of see where it goes and you can see where it ran, but I've, I've never actually seen it bouncing out of the, actually put, you know, an actual spring coming out. And it was, so it was that wet that it was beginning to pour out of that. And that was very interesting. And so people walk upon these rivers and they don't really know they're there. So they have that kind of fascination of being, um, and people used to, when, when London was young, people used to catch trout in these rivers. People, these rivers were arteries of commerce. The Lee is still it was an artery of commerce until very recently. So they all have their stories and they all have their interests and they all have their place in history. And so I, I think that's part of the fascination. You sound a bit like a history buff. I mean, it especially comes out with the architecture, but now you're talking about the rivers, you, you sound, you've done a lot of research. Well, yeah, I like research because it, you know, it, it puts off the evil day when you actually have to start writing. Um, so, but no, I'm just, I'm just interested. Uh, you know, yeah, if you want to say I'm a history buff, but I'm also, you know, a, a transport buff, and uh, and uh, and an architecture buff, and a lot of other buff. I'm, a, I'm whatever buff I need to be to write the book that I'm writing at the time. Yeah. So you know, a, a science buff, and and occasionally, and I'm. Uh, for the one after the one that's coming out, this one, I'm going to become a, 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 a City of London buff. So there you go, on the workings of the city and, and the churches, oh, okay. churches of the old churches of the city. So that's going to be an integral part. So I'm going to go and have to look up all that stuff as well. Well, that sounds interesting. Yeah, it's always fun. Yeah. Better than working, that's what I say. <laughs> In one of your Rivers of London novels, vacuuming patterns are relevant to both plot and character development. This is something else that Kath Kathleen and I were having a conversation about you on Twitter. Um, and Kathleen asks, how do you use that keen observation? Is, it, is the technique planned or organic? Keen observation? Of uh, ab about what? Of, of life. About, about... Oh, well, you know, you just make shit up, basically. <laughs> I mean, when... You I have an advantage over younger writers in that I'm 52 and you just amass more kind of experience the older you get and you're not even always aware you're doing it but it, you know the key to wisdom is experience and so therefore you can you can you know writing is just really a way of just monetizing your kind of like because otherwise it's pretty useless because no one listens to you it's not like the younger people go you go look don't do that that's a really stupid thing they go okay fuck off granddad you, know, <laughs> you know so <laughs> So, so, you know, the good thing about it is you can use it. And also, you just imagine yourself as the other person and they kind of do all the, or sometimes the characters are so strong, some of them are, that they just tell you what they're going to do. And it, it's sort of psychologically true because otherwise they wouldn't be so insistent about it. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, but I, I wouldn't claim any great kind of insight into the human condition beyond what normal people have or anything. I just, I just managed to get it written down, I think, is the, the main thing. Yeah, I'm, I'm wondering, um, this kind of relates to amassing wisdom and, and knowledge. Uh, your writing isn't usually overly political, but when discussing media responses to bad weather in Rivers of London, you quote the Daily Mail headlines as saying, illegals at my snow plow. <laughs> what inspired you? And, and having started Fox Glove Summer, I'm wondering if you've got a beef with Daily Mail because you... you 
Mike's no, I, 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 it's a bit sorry for the Daily Mail. They tend to stand in for the for the British media in general because Daily Mail is a nice short couple of syllables, uh, and Telegraph doesn't flow off the tongue quite so well. But uh, the Daily, but the Daily Mail, yeah, the Daily Mail is, is comes in for the butt. But it, it takes a strong political stance, so it can't really complain. If um, I mean, uh, when when you talk to other journalists, they have a lot of time for Daily Mail journalists. They say they're very professional. They get the facts. You just have to wonder why they're in the service of such an evil monster. No, I'm I'm being cruel. But they, they, I do not agree with them politically. The Daily Mail. I do not agree with their stance on most things. And I reserve the right. They reserve the right to to put their political stance on the news, and I reserve the right to take the piss out of them. Fair enough. But I, it's not, I don't pick, you know, pick on them particularly. I will pick on The Guardian if it's being particularly Guardian. And I would pick on The Independent, but it doesn't exist anymore. Would you like to write more political satire? No, I don't like political satire. There's too much political satire in the world. What we need is less political satire and more political action. Fair enough. Yes, I, I agree. Um, and, and it seems like you're making a few more, like... I wouldn't call your books political, but it just seems that, like there, there are little bits, um, maybe little um, pieces of your own wisdom, your own... Well, some of them are Peter's wisdom. Remember, the, it's written from Peter's point of view. And I know it's easy to say, oh, well, Ben must believe this because Peter says it, but it's not always that direct. It's not... Peter has attitudes that I don't have, you know. Peter, Peter... Peter's much more iconoclastic when it comes to architecture than I am. I'm much more favourable of certain types of modern architecture than he is. Peter likes cars. I don't like cars. You know, he likes music that I hate. Uh, so he's not entirely me. And his political views, remember, he is a police officer. So he has a, police officers tend to have a particular set of even quite liberal police officers because they're the ones getting, you know, spat on and have rocks thrown at them. They have a slightly different attitude towards, say, uh, I might have towards civil disobedience and stuff where they feel, you know, civil disobedience is not the unalloyed good that many people think it is if you're the person who's having, you know, on the other end of the, the, the petrol bomb. So, and I'm not going to say he's wrong or right, but I'm just going to say he does have a different political view. He is also, you know, much younger than me and, and uh, of mixed race. So he has, a, you know, his political views are going to be coloured by that. I have noticed in Fox Club Summer, every time he meets somebody, he comments that they're white. Oh, well, that's, that's just um, because he, he, the way he looks at people. Hmm. You know, it, it, it's, it's too, uh, in, in a lot of literature, white is, default, is, is thought to be the default position. And so the, if you don't say what someone is, you, you mention they're white. Now, you can try and pretend that you're going to be colour neutral on that. But when that happens, just everyone assumes everyone's white. Unless you sort of go, and he had brown skin, like that, very loudly in capital letters. So I thought I'd just short circuit the whole thing. And when Peter sees a white guy, he sees a white guy. I mean, he sees him as a white guy. He doesn't see him as a guy who happens to be white. He sees him as a white guy. Not in a kind of like, oh, you are a white guy, but just in a completely neutral observer way. In the same way, if, you know, if he looked at someone wearing a, it uh, looked at you, he'd say there, there is a white woman in a, in a black top. Yeah, I, it's not... I did like the way he he's mentions this person's white and this person's white and this person's white and, hmm, looks like my diversity training's going to waste in this case. <laughs> yeah, <it's... laughs> Well, because Herefordshire is not a very diverse area. So where are you taking us with the future Rivers of London? Like, do you have, have plans for, like, more novels? Oh, yeah. I'm going to keep writing them until I'm dead, basically. Oh. I, I, I deliberately made Peter so young that I won't have to worry about him retiring. I'll be dead before he has to retire, which is a, a painful problem. It's happened to a lot of other crime writers. They suddenly get to the point where they're, they're, it's just not feasible that they're inspected, you know, like Inspector Rebus. It just wasn't feasible he was still in the force. But by the time Peter's old enough to be facing mandatory retirement, I'll be dead. Mm. You know, maybe my son will be writing them or something by then, but I'll be dead, seriously dead, so it won't be a problem. Well, there are a, a number of iconic authors who have passed down their legacy to either family members or I'm, I'm planning, I know where this question is going, I'm planning to set aside a large fund to pay someone, um, a Russian mercenary, to kill anyone who tries to do that with my books. <laughs> so we're very clear about this. 
Not only will it be outlawed in my will, I will I will have a special slush fund for assassination. Yeah. So anyone who thinks, oh, anyone who tries necro literature with my stuff is going to be in real trouble. I'm just going to put that out there now in case people have any doubts about it. I, I don't condemn people to do it. I just don't want it done to my work. In the same way that I don't want anyone picking up doing a, a kind of Terry Pratchett. That would just be obscene. There is only one Terry Pratchett. I didn't want someone to carry on the Discord series. You know, however good their pastiche is, I, I wouldn't mind it in a different genre. In, in a weird way, it wouldn't matter in a different media. If they did a comic or they did a film or they did a TV series, that wouldn't bother me. But uh, no more books. And the same with Rivers of London. I, you know, if people want to make TV series and stuff like that based on it and then maybe expand the universe that way, I would be all right with that. But no one, no one's, Peter is mine. They can't have him. He's, I, he's, they I can't have him. understand that completely. And I love the fact that you dedicate Fox Club Summer to Terry Pratchett. Yes. Well, you know, it, the writing was on the wall by that stage. And I thought, um... He's, he was such an influence on me. And this book was so, so very, I mean, this one was very overtly influenced by Terry Pratchett. Fox Club Summer was very influenced by Terry, Terry Pratchett. And I looked at it and I thought this book has to be dedicated to Terry Pratchett. And so I, I dedicated it to him. And I was very glad to do that. So, and you know, and I, I, I'm, I, there are very few people who, whose deaths have affected me personally, even though I didn't know them. And then and, and was, his was one of it. You know, I'm not one of these kind of weep at the deaths of, of you know, famous strangers, but I, you know, even admirable ones, I've always been quite hard-hearted. My, my wife always complained about that. And she threw, threw me out of the house because I didn't weep at Diana's funeral, and that was, that was a bad thing. And, um, but, uh, you know, Terry Pratchett affected me, and, I, you know, I, I, I still miss him, even though I never knew him. It's just really weird. I find that quite strange that I miss someone I never met, but... There you go. Did you grow up reading his novels? Yes. Oh, I was like book one, book two, and then he was my hardback. I bought him in hardback. And that was back when I didn't have a lot of money too. Mm. And on my hard, he was on my hard book list, hardback list to buy a buy at Sorcery, and he never went off it. Mm. And, I, and and unfortunately, my son, when he was about three, ripped all the covers off my hardback. So otherwise, I would have had a complete set, pretty much of first edition Terry Pratchett's with the original covers. Oh. But there you go. But I'm I'm horrible with my books. Like my guards, guards is all annotated because mm. I wanted to see if I could turn it into a film. So I annotated it. So it's like I've never been very good at preserving things for kind of the collector's market. I would have had uh, the hard covers that were all beautiful and maybe a paperback for. No, no, you see, I, I just didn't think about that. I because I, I couldn't wait that long to read. I would I had to read them. I bought them immediately, and I would literally. Go down to it was usually Dylan's as was, which was um, now the Waterstones on Gower Street, and I would literally buy it, go into a cafe, and pretty much read the first half of it in the cafe before I even got the bus back home. So you know, it, and I used to phone them up. Remember this being before the internet. Go, is the next project out yet? Have you got the next project? Is the next project? <laughs> Yeah, these days we, we can plan ahead. It's it's much easier, but yeah, things. Well, are... now these days, you see, there's people like that, and I do have a couple of authors like that. Um, I, it gets zapped straight into my Kindle. It's like like ding zap, and then the hardbacks on its way. You know, the hardbacks, and it's terrible now because I end up buying books on three media. I tend to end up buying books on Kindle, and then I buy them on um, I buy them on in hardback or paperback and then I'd buy them on audio. So I'm getting stuff three ways now by the publishers. Well, I'm sure that the authors and publishers are absolutely, you know, stoked by that. I'm sure they're very pleased. Mm. I know I am when that happens with me. So. So who are these authors that are on your list? Well, um, there are people like CJ Cherry, uh, Lewis McMaster Bujold, uh, Tony Morrison, you see, they're getting very variable. I am in my taste, um, and people like that, and then just sometimes people that I just grab, I just see something that looks interesting, or someone will say, "You must read this." Mm. I'd, I'd have to uh, have to look at my list. Is there a particular, or are there particular aspects of storytelling that resonate with you? I like a bit of humour. Yes. 
my favourite crime writer is Stuart McBride um, because he's part of the Tartan Noir, which means it's like very grim stories set in Scotland with lots of dismemberment and violence, but they're hilarious at the same time. They are the funniest books I've ever read. As at the same time, it's been horribly shocking in times and, and disturbing. And um, I, I think he's brilliant. So, Stuart, yeah, Stuart McBride is my kind of cup of tea. I like, I like a bit of humour. I'll, I'll watch, I'll read anything with a bit of humour in it. I like humour. Not like, it not, doesn't have to necessarily be overtly funny. It doesn't have to be written for comedy. But I, I've, I hate po-faced. I hate serious. I hate educational. You know, I like, I like funny. So I suppose you were a fan of um, Terry Pratchett's like Science of Discworld series. Yes, I love those. Yes, well, <laughs> Rivers of London was in part inspired by Science of Discworld. So, yes, they were very good. And also, you know, I took any Pratchett I could get, really. <laughs> mm, yeah, yeah. Um, after three decades, three decades in the writing profession, how do you keep your storytelling buoyant? Uh, you just don't think about it too much. It's the best way. <laughs> I don't write fast enough to run out of stories. I'm still, I'm still working through my backlog. I'm, I'm going, quick, finish this book and get on the next one. You know, it's like... So, yeah, I, I, I'll, I'll ask me that in another 10 years. Fair enough. It's a date. <laughs> ask me in 10 years. Maybe I'll be running out of ideas by then. I hope not. So what are your plans for the future, other than surviving Brisbane? Um, well, uh, I've got to survive the flight back to London, which mm -hmm. is no mean feat. Uh, then the jet lag of the flight back to London. And then I've got to um, finish the next... I've got to get the next comic done. God, I've got a comic. I've got a hand in the comic on the 4th of April, so that's quite important. So the Rivers of London comics, they're really coming. I noticed there was about, I think there was six or more of them listed already. Yeah, we have a we have a trade of the first five, and the next the next batch of five have started, <laughs> and there's another five commissioned after that, mm. and um, Titan seem very pleased with them. So I think that's going to continue on, and those are all original stories, so they're not adaptations of the books, and the beauty of them is it allows you to follow characters that you can't follow in the books because the books are all done from Peter's point of view, mm -hmm. but comics being a different media, that's not necessarily desirable. To always follow everything from Peter's point of view. Mm. So in the current one, Peter actually is not as prominent. He's kind of more of a framing device than, than uh, and it's more about people like Nightingale, it's more about um, Vivara, the next one is, and stuff like that. And that's kind of fun. Then the next one is going to be a bit more Peter and Galid solve crime, and then, you know, and then the next one, who knows? The, we have a lot of possibilities out there. Oh, sounds good. I'll have to go and talk to my local comic book store. You must talk to your local comic book store. Yeah. Demand. Demand them now. And they have really good covers, too. Oh, look, my local comic book store is so good, they probably already have a copy waiting yeah, for me sure before that. I even knew that I wanted it. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, who would win, Xena or Rassilon? Who would win, Xena or Rassilon? Xena. And why is that? Um, because she would do that shrieky thing and while he was still complaining about the noise she'd hit him <laughs> oh excellent <laughs> uh, okay so the uh, last book you published was Fox Club Summer and, and we're hearing all about the comic books that we need to go and talk to our local comic book stores about uh, sorry what's the name of the next the, the next one is called The Hanging Tree yeah yes and um, is there anything else we should be keeping an eye out for no, God, no. Oh, well, there might be a TV series, but that's on such a... I don't know what the timetable will be on that. So so you can keep an eye out for it, but you'll probably fall asleep while waiting for it to arrive. Oh, I almost forgot. Um, didn't you originally write a pilot for a TV series for Rivers of London and then it became a much-changed format to actually become the novel? Uh, no, what happened was I developed it as an idea. I never got as far as actually writing the pilot, but I did the... When you're when you're developing an idea for television, you do a lot of like preliminary character ideas and make a lot of notes and plot ideas. Um, you don't really move on to a pilot until you you're quite clear of what the format's going to be, and it never really it didn't actually get that far. So it was a it was a collection of ideas and a couple of scenes and a couple of ideas for scenes, quite a lot of which became Rivers of London, and quite a lot some of which didn't, and some you know, the initial encounter with the ghost you know is pretty much as as 
was written the first things I ever wrote and it stayed in the book. Um, but the, where that took place is completely different and why that took place is completely different. Nightingale's characteristics is quite different and things like that. And, and Peter was a woman in the, in the TV series. So, you know, but I mean, to call it a TV series is to really over that It was, it's me, it was a, a kind of paper thin fantasy in my head. Like most TV series before they, if they don't get made, it's just, it's just something. So it didn't actually make it to Development Hell. It didn't. No, it didn't make it even as far as Development Hell. And I, I, I decided it was. It wasn't something that at that time I could have sold anyway. So. But now. But now, well, but now, yeah, because they like books, and so there's a book. Ironically, there's a book, and that was my way back into television has been via my books. Who know? Who the thunk? <laughs> and Game of Thrones has been so popular that now. There, there are all sorts of fantasy stories that are in development. Yeah, but you see, the thing is, is that you got, you don't understand the mind of the TV producers. They, they, they want people wearing fur doing a lot of raping because that's that's, that's essentially Game of Thrones. Game of Thrones! Lots of people in furs raping people. Yay! Lots of boobs. <laughs> With boobs. <laughs> yeah, so you, you don't think they're really quite at the more intelligent fantasy yet i mean i'm not saying that game of thrones isn't intelligent i think some of the intelligence has been lost in the screen production i i i don't know things like that things like game of thrones happen more by accident than by by design good television happens by accident mostly i mean i i don't mean to denigrate the role of people working very hard but there are hundreds of people working very hard to bring good television and and about three or four times as many people working very hard to bring bad television to your screens. And the process by which one or the other gets made is almost an entirely random process that really obeys no rational rules that you can possibly divine. So, you know, things, good things get made, bad things get made. Sometimes the good things are very good. Sometimes you get a run of good things and people declare a golden age of television. Sometimes you get a run of bad things and people, you know, complain that television's awful. Well, that's true. And I've seen things with a really good premise that just haven't quite... Worked. Yes, well, and things things that shouldn't work. Like um, the current series of Lucifer. I was completely contentious of the current series of Lucifer. And I'm sitting there watching it going, oh, this is terrible, this is terrible. And I can't help noticing I'm still watching it going, this is terrible. And every so often it'll just make me go, hmm. And at some point it will either... The hmms will either proliferate it will find its stride and it will stretch off. And even though it has nothing to do with the characters in the comics in any way, really, it will become a classic or, or it will collapse under the weight of all the terribleness. But I don't know which one that's going to be. I suspect the people making it don't know which one that's going to be, but it will be interesting finding out. But some things have a spark. You, you think they should be terrible and they have a spark of something. If you think about Xena, Xena was like, generally <laughs> considered to be appalling when it started. And now it's like a vast cult classic that everyone remembers fondly. But it was like a terrible Hercules ripoff when it started. It was a spin off from Hercules. Oh, that can't be ancient Greece. Oh, they're messing up the myths. Oh, look, that's very unconvincing. And she doesn't have any biceps anyway. Look, that's just completely fake. And 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 it follows a formula. And it's not, you know, it's all shot very cheaply in New Zealand. But now everyone, you know, Xena's and there was something about it. It just caught a little spark somewhere, and that spark can be fanned into a flame, and you can end up with something that will haunt you all the way, all your days. But no one. No one can bottle that. If they had bottled that, would have it all the time. But no one really knows why, where that comes from. It's very hit and miss. And you, you just keep making stuff in the hope that sooner or later something good will come out of it. Francesca Hay wrote uh, an academic essay about Twilight and um, snark and ironic fandom, talking about how people engage with texts not necessarily because it's good, but in a critical way and, and actually criticising it as in, you know, review criticism, not necessarily just tearing it apart, is actually part of the pleasure. So if something's partly good and partly bad, and I mean, Xena's, I think, is a great example because you've, you've got the feminist aspect and you've got the, the queer community was totally on board and, and, you know, and yet some of it was so bad. 
as you said. And I think maybe it's this, this combination of things. And other people are talking about, oh, you know, if something's camp, it's just wonderful. And if it's silly, it's wonderful. But somehow or other, as you say, you know, you need that bottled element. But do you think it's part of this um, intellectual criticism that's part of the... I, I, I don't know. You see, this is something that... <sighs> I, I've got to admit, I don't have a lot of time for, for intellectual academics. I mean, I mean, I have a lot of time for them, but I don't have a lot of time for um, analysis of, of, of culture because um, I'm, I, I'm kind of like the person who's with the, with the pick at the cold face, banging out the culture. And the academics always strike me as the people who are picking through the kind of stuff that's going down the, 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 the conveyor belt back from the coal face. Mm. And they're talking about like the quality of the ore and the thing and oh shiny that diamond just came off the line there and it really has very little to do with what I'm doing which is hitting the you know hitting the rock face with a great big axe or, or with a great big pick and I don't know whether there and and also academics have come up with this idea which is like the, the author fallacy which which essentially has erased me from the process in the first place which I haven't forgiven them for. So I, I'm, I, I, I have decided that there's uh, the reviewer fallacy, which is the idea that the reviewer has, exists and, and that reviews only exist in, in, in themselves and the actual person who wrote the review doesn't really exist. And so there's no point reading stuff by people who don't exist. That's my thinking. Well, it sounds like a, an interesting philosophical idea. No, it, it really is. Is that it, basically, if you're a writer, don't read reviews. It just makes you go crazy, and you, you and you want to bite people, even even quite good reviews. Yeah, for for authors, and I, any author who tells different lies, right? It's not even the one stars. It's the four and a half stars you object to. It's it's a very kind of what my <laughs> very Jewish mother thing. It's kind of like you know, it's like yeah. Uh, there's the famous Jewish joke about the, the, the guy whose mother buys him two shirts for for his birthday and, the, and and he makes sure the next time he sees his mother to wear make sure he's wearing one of the shirts and his mother looks at him and goes, Oh, you didn't like the other shirts? <laughs> like that. So it's like, you know, we're reading a review, oh, this is a good view, this person likes me, and they say, well, the one thing I didn't like, I will just explain it right. Ah! <laughs> Because we just want praise, basically, and and you know, there's no because there's when authors talk about other authors' work, it's usually at the level of the sort of carpentry. So it's rather like the way we're going. Oh yeah, that was a really good mortise lock that he did on the corner of that. And so I will talk to other writers, and we will talk about how plot points have been fitted in, or that was very clever the way they did that elision kind of that kind of carpentry level of thing. And and academic reviewers are not talking about that. They're talking about, I don't know, they're talking about interesting stuff, but it's not anything to do with the actual hammer and tongs element of writing. And so therefore, um, I sort of, they're over there, I'm over here. It's kind of like, you know. Yeah, you're, you're, you're discussing apples, they're discussing oranges. Well, no, I, I'm, I'm discussing um, uh, horticulture. And they're discussing fruit flans from Sainsbury's. That's the way I. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, that, that's the separation. Okay. Well, thank you very much for, for talking to me today. That's I, right. It was a pleasure. You, you're in the middle of, of a big tour of Australia. And um, yes. is there a conference in Brisbane at the moment? Uh, there is a, a convention, Contact 2016, or Max 2016. I can't tell what it's called. They keep changing the name on me. And it's a very full of very nice people who can organise, definitely organise a piss-up in a brewery. I can point, I can say that without <laughs> doubt. It's very, I, I've seen people do this for, for a living and it's very hard work. And these guys are, uh, are sort of, they're volunteers. So they're not professionals and they're doing a really good job so far especially from the keeping your authors happy kind of point of view. It's, uh, of course, from my point of view, the crucial aspect. Well, thank you very much and have a great trip and have a safe flight back to London.